we would all agree that at this time, the world is facing a crisis, a severe pandemic, which we had never experienced before. So in responding to this crisis, there are many modes of response. In some cases, we call this a time of wuka, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. In this time of wuka, it is, uh, what do we call it? A time where we have to respond to this uh, volatility with our own clarity. Now, in responding, people have a number of options. One of the options that people respond is with panic. And yet, 50 years ago, exactly on the 13th of April, 1970, the world was faced with an episode where a spacecraft, Apollo 13, went into space on the attempt to land at the moon. There was a crisis. This is exactly 50 years ago, Apollo 13. And the three crew members managed to stay calm they overcame the crisis and four days later, on the 17th of April, 1970, Apollo 13 landed safely. That's a credit to the leadership of these three crew members. On the other hand, in the present crisis, we have a series of responses recently reported. There was one reporter in the Asian newspaper captain of a fishing boat was thrown overboard by his own crew because the crew heard him coughing and sneezing over a period of time and they could not stand it anymore. They thought they were going to catch the virus from him. They threw him overboard. Poor man was left to flounder in the sea. Fortunately, some hours later, he was rescued. Now, it shows that human beings respond to crisis in different ways. To quote a very famous uh, uh, a leader, a leader that did well in times of crisis, the General George Casey, leader of the coalition uh, group that was uh, running uh, Iraq. He said, they faced with a WUKA, a, a, a situation of such volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. He said, leaders have to control what they can control, influence what they cannot control, and prepare for what they can't control. Now, all this requires a leader to be in excellent mental and emotional health. So welcome to our webinar this afternoon from STAC, where we are going to discuss how can a leader face these times of crisis with a sense of gratitude, thankfulness, and how to handle with the calmness that is required. Now, also in the recent news, there was a very sad case of a leader who didn't make it, the finance minister of a state in Germany, Mr. Thomas Schaefer, such a committed, very serious leader. He felt overcome with the situation and it was reported, this happened about just under two weeks ago, Mr. Thomas Schaefer killed himself because he just did not know how to handle this pandemic crisis. Now, I'm going to discuss this afternoon on a model which will help us face this with certainty and with the ability to manage the crisis from a perspective of our own mental health. And I'm going to introduce to you a model I developed as a professor of psychology from the University of Malaya. It's called the LPI model, Landed Personality Inventory. In this model, we're going to explore your behaviors, which is let us explore five factors of our behaviors, openness, neutral, analytical, relational, decisive. Now, in these five factors, 
all human beings, when they are born, they are born with certain genetic endowment, personality factors. And so if someone has uh, 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 what you call it, emotional intelligence to handle their personality, they come up as a working adult, as somebody we call emotionally intelligent, meaning he has awareness of himself, is able to manage the weaknesses inside his personality, and that's called intrapersonal skill. So a high EQ person as a leader, he has intrapersonal skill. What are these six skills? The intrapersonal skill of self-awareness, knowing my personality structure, and self-regulation, ability to manage the weaknesses. Now, the high EQ leader is also able to have interpersonal skill. What is interpersonal skill? It's the sub-skills of being able to empathize, especially with someone different from me, and also actual relational skills to deal with different types of people around us. Hence, EQ in a leader in facing a crisis is of paramount importance. Now, high EQ is something everybody say, yes, I, I agree I should be, but why is it so difficult to be high EQ? Why is it so difficult for me, in spite of knowing that some things I should do, but I can't do? Knowing that some things I shouldn't do, but I keep doing. Well, that's We call it the neurotic tendency in the human being. And so, I'm going to explain to you from our research, what makes it so difficult to practice EQ? That knowing EQ does not make us high EQ. Knowing what I should do, what I should not do, that does not guarantee that I will be high EQ. Now, usually in a participative workshop, when I give a series of numbers like this, so people will add up the numbers and finally they will get 4,090 because you keep adding 1,000, 1,040, 2,000, and then you will end up with a total of 4,090. Now, this exercise, when done, and we ask people, let's do a second round and ask them to add up at some point up to 4,000, when we put a 10, because of the self-talk in that inside the individual. The self-talk makes them expect a 5,000, and a lot of individuals from their perception will see 5,000 instead of the actual 4,100. Now, I usually explain to individuals that the reason that we do that, our left brain inside us, the left side of our brain, interprets things from the self-talk. I mean, as a human being looks at the environment around us, the perception affects us. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to be high EQ is that perception causes us to become low EQ. It's a perceptual function. Now, over a period of many years research, we came out with a model that explains this, and that is, from the spiritual heart, we need to be well enough. This wellness inside spiritual heart makes us feel good. That sense of being feeling good releases the feel-good hormone. I'm going to explain, give the technical name of the hormone. Uh, that feel-good hormone causes us accurate perception. So how does a leader handle the external world that is full of volatility and uncertainty. He must practice excellent mental health. That feel-good hormone must come out. As the feel-good hormone comes out, our perception of the external world changes. In fact, it becomes more accurate. On the other hand, when a person's feel-good hormone is insufficient, it gets down to a serious level that is too low, then the perception of the external world becomes distorted. That distortion produces low EQ behavior. So one scientific explanation, what's the difference between 
the astronauts who could manage the sudden change in the environment and remain calm enough, they were well trained and well enough inside to handle the crisis. Why are some other individuals unable to do that? It could be a predisposition earlier. It could be a sudden onslaught upon their mental health. When the level of these feel-good hormones drop in us, we are likely to be unable to handle the external world. In the research, we started to investigate different personality types. And I'll just skip the illustration here. When a person has high emotional excellence, so let's say he has a certain personality tendency. His tendency is to have high openness. He's very open to ideas. He's open to uh, be imaginative. He creates things. Now, that's a person who shows high openness. So we call him a creative imaginator. One of the five factors is openness. So the openness person is not open to people. He's open to new ideas himself, inside himself. He's imaginative, curious, likes new things, wants to do things different. But when unable to practice self-regulation, this high in, uh, openness person easily gets bored becomes impulsive, does things in an impulsive manner that can endanger for those around them. And using a tool called the LPI, we can get a profile of this person. If you notice, O-N-A-R-D. So this individual, high O, his openness score is the highest. Uh, he likes to try new things, enjoy artistic activities. Right? Now, how about the weaknesses? Someone like this, when unable to practice self-regulation, weakness, he finds working in team too much of a bother, argumentative with others, breaking rules, easily bored, tend to be impulsive. So this is the openness factor. Usually you can find in young people much more openness. As a person gets older, somehow, we lose this. The environment causes, uh, forces us to stop practicing openness. Now, the second factor is called the neutral factor. The neutral factor can combine with the openness or it can combine with the analytical or the relational. But if you notice in the research findings, the neutral factor at one corner, top upper left, and somebody with a lot of neutral uh, tendencies calm nice, a good listener, more relaxed and easygoing. But when not too well inside, perception affected, that person can easily get hurt by others and may lack confidence. I use the term neutral because a person like this, is uh, you likened to a neutral gear of the car. In the neutral gear, you can put it forward, the car will go forward. to reverse, the car will go reverse. Hence, if you are endowed with a neutral personality, the worst is that person is a calm, relaxed, very adaptable individual. It's not going to cause trouble to the environment around. Now, this is a graph with high neutral, O-N-A-R-D. You see the N picks up. And whenever the N is high, the neutral is high, very likely the decisive is much lower. In many uh, uh, real graphs that we have seen, N high, the D will be low, opposite. That's because the self-talk in the N and the D are opposite. When the N is looking for stability, uh, security, accepted a sense of belonging, the D is looking for the opposite. It's not interested in stability. He wants to get results. So N people, good listeners, supportive of others, value being appreciated by others, require a relaxed, friendly atmosphere to work best. Now, how about the N weaknesses? The N person tend to be much more self-conscious, lacking confidence in own self, can get 
anxious easily. In these times of crisis, and leadership would be more likely to panic, more likely to look for the line of least resistance. The end person has a tendency to avoid confrontations with others, get hurt easily. Right? In many cases, they need to learn to be a go-getter. So we have talked about the O factor, the N. Now the third factor would be the high analytical. On this trapezium, you will notice is on the right hand side. The N was on the left hand side. The A is on the right hand side. The N people are more feeling, people oriented. The A people are more task oriented. So a typical A uh, approach in life, careful, cautious, analytical, likes to do things correctly. But they tend to worry easily. They find it hard to express their feelings. Now, A people, individuals, conscientious, quiet and reserved, but would prefer to be precise. We found in the actual research that NA is a very common combination. N and A combined together. That makes a person a classical introvert. He likes to be calm and nice, but at the same time, systematic and accurate. So we came up with the term, a person with N and A is called an error buster. He doesn't like to face errors. He wants things to be well controlled. Now, so error buster strength, must do things correctly. Genuinely enjoy a low profile, but have internal standards inside them. So we call this a classical introvert. Now, when facing a crisis, introverts have a habit of reverting back into themselves. That means keeping clammed up all within oneself. And that can build up a great source of uh, mental unwellness. Towards the last uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to give suggestion how introverts will need to seriously uh, manage this internal stress inside them in this time of crisis. Now, how about the opposite, the other side of the coin? These are relational, fun-loving people. Uh, certain cultures are much more fun-loving. If you go, uh, as part of my research, I had to compare two countries. One was Germany, which had AD, a lot of AD personality. And just the neighboring Italy, we had R, but the R is mixed with the O, O-R. So this was the actual research, empirical research. We collected the data. Uh, now, relational people are friendly, optimistic, fun-loving, exciting. In theory, when facing crisis, they handle it much more better. But uh, because in, in, in times where you are all isolated on your own, that itself can be a source of stress for the relational person. Because they are fun loving, uh, let's call them a party animal, they like to mix with people. Now you lock them all alone, just stuck there in the house with the family, then it can be stressful. Now, relational people, you can see that with this graph, high R, the strength, yeah, they, uh, the weakness here, I listed the weakness. Uh, they need to be center of attention, restless, but the strength, full of life excitement, optimistic. Uh, you want such a person around in times of crisis. So R, huh? now, how about the final one, O-N-A-R? The final one is the D. Somebody with a lot of D, decisive tendency, is at the extreme end on the opposite. We call him action-oriented extrovert, but he wants to get result. So the D, uh, picking an example of a high D, very fast moving, decisive, result-oriented. Some literature indicate a lot of firstborn tend to be D, not all, but generally firstborn for some reason, social, emotional reason, they tend to develop the D, especially if they were already born with a G tendency, the D uh, tendency. 
Uh, high D people, decisive, quick result, competitive, likes to win, risk taker. I'm sure in your office you have seen someone like this. Treat them like as if they've been born as a guided missile. <laughs> as you see them, be clear, there is something in their mind that's a goal. So if you come between them and the goal, that's when they get easily impatient, easily irritated. Uh, in these times of uh, no movement, it can be quite frustrating for a D person because they require to move. Now, I've just outlined an introduction about necessity of mental health. Mental health is often affected by perception. The perception comes from the self-talk inside the person. Now, if you are born with different personalities, O, N, A, R, D, for us to be high EQ, we need, first of all, self-awareness of our personality strength, weaknesses. Then we can have an attempt to self-regulate ourselves. That self-regulation requires healthy perception. Now, similarly, healthy perception helps us, motivate us to empathize. The skill to empathize with others, relate with them, that's called interpersonal skill. So both intrapersonal and interpersonal skills, they are affected by perceptual hormones. In the last 20 minutes or so, I'm going to explain the importance of these perceptual hormones and how to manage our body, our mind and our spiritual heart so that we have an optimal level of the perceptual hormones. Now, just before I go into that, I need to lock up this part and summarize this uh, part about the personality by completing a discussion between people of different personalities. Let's say in our family now, one person is introvert and A. The other party is extrovert. We need an awareness that the introvert and the extrovert can easily suffer pacing conflict. Why? Because the perception of the introvert N or A or NA person, he feels the extrovert is too fast, impulsive. On the other hand, the extrovert R or D person, his perception is the introvert is too slow. And so this is called pacing conflict. Now, group one is the introvert, group two is the extrovert. They suffer a pacing conflict. How about group three? Group three are people who are N or R. They have a priority for feelings. Group three individuals, their priorities for feeling, if they have to interact with a group four, group four is A and D, their priority is for task. As a result, these two in, uh, groups of individuals can have priority conflict. I give as an example, there's uh, two individuals here. Uh, husband and wife came for counseling many, many years ago. And after 10 years of marriage, they were facing a severe crisis in their life. They wanted to get divorced. Now, one look at the LPI graph, and you can see husband is slow. Why? It's an R factor, tends to be fast. They have pacing conflict for sure. Built up over 10 years, that was causing them serious conflict. The wife, NR, she's a people-oriented person. The husband, is A, A is task-oriented. So they have pacing conflict as well. I mean, uh, priority conflict. But there was one more conflict that both were not aware and that is deep in the human hearts, all of us have a need to feel secure, which is to be accepted, a sense of belonging, and we have a need to feel significant. And that is, am I important to you? Do I add value? All human beings have this need inside. A common mistake is to mistake the need for security as, oh, I must have a big house, a bigger car as a sector symbol. No, we are talking about social, emotional security. So to feel secure is to feel accepted. It's not size of house or car. 
To feel secure is a sense of being uh, belonging in a group. Now, with this, we have outlined the need of security, significance in the spiritual heart, inside the mind, managing it well, and finally, in the body, showing high EQ behaviors. Now, this next part is to now explain how the perceptual hormones come out. So all of life, when we look forward towards something positive, like our grandfather's birthday, then our perception is positive, we feel good, and a feel-good hormone is released. That, that phenomena is called eustress. What is eustress? Eustress is a perception that things are going well, I'm looking forward to this challenge, and that's called eustress. Psychologically, eustress is very, very important. Lack of eustress will produce distress. Now, distress is defined in this way. Anytime we are not looking forward to something positive, anytime we feel bad, we are not feeling good, then our feel-good hormone levels will drop. As it drops, we experience something called distress. So a question, a common question I'm asked, say, oh, uh, Professor Young, if I, I, I avoid distress, I know I should not want distress, but I'm not interested to invest in new stress. Is that possible? I leave you stress alone, but I avoid distress. Well, my answer is a very simple answer. No. Why? If you are not in new stress, you are already in distress. By that definition, lots of us are in distress. Why? Because we are not in new stress. Now, I go on to explain that all of life is perception. So in the case where we have a perception of negative perception towards something, then the body goes into distress. In fact, too much of perception, the distress can aggravate our health. That's because when we are not feeling good about ourselves, actually, we are under distress. So and stress, the immune system actually drops and the person can suffer what we call psychosomatic disease. Uh, these days, with all this stress, one of the most common psychosomatic problems that we will hear of, insomnia, in three forms. Cannot fall asleep, that's the most common form, insomnia, or sleep, but cannot sleep through. Our sleep is disrupted every few hours. And the other final type of insomnia, we are sleeping, but usually we wake up 6.30, but now at 4.30 a.m. we wake up, we can't sleep again. So the three common symptoms of insomnia when we are facing stress. Towards the last part of this talk, I will give simple uh, uh, steps that we can do to manage it. Now, as a person starts to feel unwell, so the question would be, how can I move myself to positive perception? Do I have a choice? The answer, yes, is called choice theory. Those who would like to read further on choice theory, just go Google Dr. William Glasser, very well-known psychiatrist, postulated this many years ago. He says, the human being has a choice. He must choose the positive. Now, to illustrate choice theory, I'll just show a simple case study of choice theory. If your audio has been muted, can you pick it up now? Somehow get the sound going. And here's a case of choice theory. Come with raising a child? I had a lot of concern. I knew I could take care of them. I mean, I spent most of my teenage years babysitting other people's kids, so I knew I could but I had never really taken care of a newborn 24-7. You know, it's rough. Did that tickle? There's nothing rough about this amazing young mom. She uses her incredible dexterity to handle the most delicate tasks with tender, loving care. I can pretty much do anything, just about anything with my feet that you can do with your hands. And 
while Barb doesn't have time to dwell on her differences, most people can't seem to get over them. Even a night at the movies can turn into a challenge. Um, I get some strange reactions. Went to the movies and handed my ticket to the, to the guy, and he wouldn't even, didn't want to take it. Because he didn't want to touch my foot. Barb has tried prosthetic arms, but found that they only get in her way. And while she's comfortable without them, there are special considerations when using your feet, like hands. If I'm going to be walking around outside and then I'm going to eat, of course I'm going to go wash my feet first. And now with taking care of her family and running a small business from home, Barb is busier than ever. And with all the incredible things that she can do, what's most remarkable is the fact that she's never once thought of giving up. Like to encourage and she creatively finds a way to manage the child, to carry the child. So, in her case, our explanation, Barb Guerra was well, she was feeling well. Someone who is very well, I apologize, I'm moving this slightly because this is new for me. We have just gone back to the first slide. Someone who is well, secure, significant they will start to practice openness to new ideas. They start to be healthy, spirit, mind, and body. So how does one achieve this wellness? Right? In Barbara's case, we know, because from the case study, she had this accident at two and a half. The parents had a choice, and the parents choose that they will make her secure, make her significant, as a result, they helped her through her childhood. Now, as an adult, Mark Guerra demonstrates this wellness inside her. She's secure. She's significant. She enjoys her life. She's facing the crisis in her life with a good mental attitude. And so, as I explained, the you stress is the cause of the feel-good hormone coming out. We look forward to something. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this research on the perceptual hormone as well as the choice theory was so important, it has led to... Uh, it, it was a pivotal uh, discovery, 1975 discovery of the feel-good hormone, uh, Johns Hopkins University. Now, that feel-good hormone discovered uh, was actually by accident. They were not looking for the hormone. They were looking for an answer to morphine addiction. The research team at John Hopkins University did not start out in the research to look for a feel-good hormone. They were looking for an answer to morphine addiction. And... The reason for that morphine addiction in the 70s in the US was a direct result of the Vietnam War where for the first time in a major war, morphine was used to save soldiers' lives. Why was morphine used? Morphine is a medication that can cause change of perception. So you can well imagine young soldier steps on a landmine, half the leg blown, he would have died from the trauma, the thought, I'm going to die, and the heart will beat fast, and the blood will shoot out. Uh, one jab of the morphine changed his perception. Within 12, 15 minutes, the soldier's perception from, I'm going to die, it changes to, oh, that's only half a leg. I still have one and a half legs. Now, that change of perception can trigger the calming down effect, and subsequently, they can have other medication and the young soldier's life is safe. But then how did it trigger a serious social problem back at home? Well, as the war was not received well back at the continent, so the soldier goes home, is seen as a person who has caused harm to others. There was a sense of disillusionment, if you remember the days of the hippie movement. In the midst of the hippie movement, young people singing around, sad, I, where are my friends gone? Where are the flowers gone? In their sadness and disillusionment, they remember at wartime, one jab of the morphine 
gives you a high feeling for a number of hours. So they went to experiment with this morphine and soon the addiction set in. Now, before the scientists could find a reason, the cause of the addiction, it got worse. How did it get worse? Well, some of them were creative. They say, if morphine is so high, can I make it higher? So by a series of chemical processes, the morphine was transformed to something much more powerful, heroin. It's interesting to know why they call it heroin. The heroin addict, before he jabs himself, his perception is, I am zero. Nobody cares for me. Father is angry with me. Wife has run away. I'm zero. One jab of the heroin, 15 minutes later, no more zero. I am hero. So they call it hero in him. Hence the word heroin. Now, the baffled scientist suddenly something unusual, which is, why was the morphine or heroin so powerful in changing the perception and making people feel high? It was something to do with the brain receptor cell, the opiate receptor cell. They found that the morphine heroin comes and then latch itself like a key into the keyhole inside the human brain. As it goes in, a sense of satisfaction comes. The soldier said, oh, uh, I'm not going to die. I still have one and a half legs. The change of perception brings the calmness. And uh, the heroin addict said, no more zero, I am hero. So this artificial morphine was going into the receptor cell and causing a change of perception. But why should it do that? After all, this morphine heroin was a human invention less than 200 years old. Yet the human brain is thousands of years old. How could it have a ready-made keyhole for morphine heroin? Only if the brain was expecting something natural. So the scientists added two and two together. What did morphine heroin do? It makes people feel high. So they went around looking for that feel-good hormone. In 1975, they found it. The feel-good hormone was actually natural morphine. So they call it endogenous morphine, short form into endorphins. Endorphins are the secret of the perceptual health happiness. And endorphins are released inside us, we feel well. That perception of feeling well is a perception that comes out to us when our endorphin level optimal. When endorphins are released, our immune system is boosted up. We in fact, a cell, a cellular action, it becomes healthier. Endorphins cause us to have accurate problem solving. Endorphins are those things that will come out when we want to solve a problem, when we get excited and we want to be creative. And finally, endorphins are a natural painkiller. Ladies and gentlemen, benefit number three is the secret to having good mental health in facing crisis. Since endorphins, help us get accurate problem-solving perception. So if I'm facing a problem, Bob Vera's parents looking at the two and a half year old girl lost her arms. Now, if they looked at it in a negative way, the stupid girl lost her arms, why did she get this accident? So when they look at it in a negative, sort of a blaming way, regretful way, then they are not interested to solve problem. Whenever we are not interested to solve problem, we have gone into self-pity. Self-pity means that we are not interested to solve problem. The brain quickly responds. Master doesn't want to solve problem. Therefore, switch off endorphin. So anyone who indulges in self-pity of regretting the past, blaming others, He's causing, he's inflicting a self-inflicted harm on his mental health. 
level of endorphin will start to drop. The person gets disappointed, depressed, and this can easily happen to us in this time of pandemic. Individuals are facing all sorts of difficulties, oppression, things beyond our control in these times of VUCA, right? volatility, uncertainty. And so the opposite to self-pity is we accept. We said, okay, but Vera's parents said she has lost her arms, but she has legs. The poor girl has no arms, but what does she have? She has legs, and we are practicing thankfulness for what we still have. That thankfulness for what we still have makes us in a problem-solving mode. And dolphins come out when we want to solve problems. So somebody who is thankful, not complacent, not a matter of looking at something and say, I cannot do anything about it, but looking at the present reality and then saying to oneself, it's not as bad as it looks. I still have this. And so there are many, many case studies of individuals who show this mental resilience. I'm sure at the Apollo 13, 50 years ago, the crew members there practiced some form of positive ability to handle the reality. Now, someone who continuously do this has self-regulation of himself. He's aware of his weaknesses. He learns to overcome the weaknesses. That process, we call it self Actualization. Now, in practice, how do we do that? The good news is, in the scientific research on the endorphin, we found two types. One is called short-term endorphins. On the right-hand side of the slide, you will see this. Short-term endorphins are endorphins that come out easily. They last three hours in our body. They are required as a kickstart to long-term endorphins, which come from thankfulness. Now, I'll talk on the right-hand side first, short-term endorphin. Scientific research has confirmed that if we can manage our body by moving the two circulatory liquids, cardiovascular blood system, lymphatic system, the limb which is the immune system, move these two liquids very fast for half an hour through exercise that is compliant to our fitness level. This means that do not overdo it. If you have not been running for the last 20 years, don't after this webinar talk, go and run 20 kilometers in your house. I will not be responsible for the heart attack that you may get. Healthy exercise is always proportionate to our fitness level. That means we never exercise beyond our fitness level, never to the extent of panting seriously, about to drop in fatigue. That's not good exercise. Now, healthy exercise that doesn't push our fitness level beyond its limit and done regularly. Ideally, every day with one day rest, less ideal, minimum three times a week. May I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to just start this evening after webinar, just find some way, doing some housework, moving the body, do it without feeling too exhausted, but do it until you sweat. So it needs a long time for some people whose fitness level is not so good. They have to do it gradually, push every day, but do it until you sweat. After that, at the point of a sweat breaking out in your body, you will notice your mood suddenly becomes better than before. The reason endorphins has been released in your body. Those are the short-term endorphins. Now, another aspect of managing the body is to understand we have a body clock called the circadian cycle, which is 24 hours. And in the morning, it is imperative. It's a must that we get about an hour of morning sun, no matter where we live. Morning sun meaning we expose our bodies to morning sun, the face is having the sun, the eyes never look at the sun, but once we are exposed to morning sun, say up to 10 a.m., the geographical location you are in, then what will happen? The hormone is called melatonin. It's a sleep hormone. It will be switched off naturally. And then tonight, 
from 10 to 12 p.m., it will switch on naturally. And you need the melatonin to be switched on so that you can sleep well through the night. Try it tomorrow morning. In the morning, somehow, make sure you get about an hour of morning sun. But never look at the sun directly. Just let your body, your face get the morning sun. And then you will notice at night, you get drowsy between 10 to 12 p.m. Uh, that's the time to go to sleep. And so managing the body is to exercise the body. That's for melatonin, uh, for endorphin to come up, sorry. And then making sure our body obeys the body clock circadian cycle by getting morning sun. And that's to switch off sleep hormone in the morning so that circadian cycle kicks in and then in the night, melatonin release naturally and we sleep. So that is ensuring we get short-term endorphin. Now with that short-term endorphin giving us a good mood, now the long-term endorphin, we can get it with a simple technique called tent. I designed the tent. It's based on the most modern method of knowing the mind, that inside of our mind, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT that all feelings are produced by thoughts. So whenever we have bad feeling, it was triggered by a bad thought. Therefore, in the tent, I combine CBT knowledge together with from the practice of our present therapy methods. We found many people need to be thankful inside their heart. Now it's called tent. So the first step in the tent is simple CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, as your eyes are open or closed, you are breathing gently, think of a good memory to produce a thanksgiving attitude. For example, uh, you could have a memory 25 years ago. Now try to recollect it, make it bigger, brighter, clearer, enjoy the memory, smile to yourself. As you enjoy that memory, you find a flood, like a wave of good feelings coming inside you. Why? Well, that's simple CBT. By thinking this good memory, your cognition when positive, your feeling, affection will be positive. That's the CBT uh, discovery that we know. Therefore, first step, Thanksgiving attitude by thinking a good memory, visualizing it, making it bigger, brighter, clearer. Now, as we are doing that and we are getting relaxed, then at this moment, for example, I'm doing it now, my watch says it is uh, 3.50, 10.50 Dubai time. Now it's 10, uh, 11.50 Dubai time. I only have this time. When we started at 11.00 Dubai time, about 50 minutes ago, it has come, it has gone. We will never get 11 a.m. again on the 13th April. It has come and gone. Now we have 11.50. And in one minute, that's gone. Now this E is to be present. The scientific word for it, we call it technically mindfulness. Your mind is focused on now. Or some people call it intentionality. Enjoy the now. People who cannot respond well to a crisis, their mind is already into the dark future. Especially you make, wake up middle of the night filled with fears of the night, we call it. Well, that's because you have stopped enjoying your now. Need to practice the tent more, which is thanksgiving attitude from good memory, enjoy the now. The third step, most people are oppressed from memories of the past. Example, someone who failed something in his life. Uh, there was a case of someone went for study somewhere, he failed, he came back, he was depressed over a period of years, he ended up totally suicidal. Then the thought of leaving his two children around was so sad, he killed the two children, then killed himself and left a suicide note for the wife. The reason for that happen, uh, happening, the man could not accept the past. So usually I use a gesture to teach my clients to do this. 
the hand, if he's right-handed or left hand, it has happened. What has happened? The negative thing, it has happened. So in this case, the pandemic has happened. We don't have control over it. It has happened. Then we bring it back. And inside us, we say, I accept the reality. I repeat it. The first one was, it has happened. The second is, I accept this reality. It has happened. And the finally, I can learn and benefit from it because I accepted it. Now, once we have done it, the first three, the last step is to hold back both hands empty. Now, it depends on your cultural, philosophical background. In Asia, especially in Malaysia, they grew up with a notion of a creator God. You know, they, we can have different philosophies, different religious labels or naming, but we accept the reality of a creator God who made us. So we said, we are thankful. Both hands are open eh, to our creator God. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to customize it. Be creative how you will manage it. But these four points are first, Thanksgiving attitude, which is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Thoughts produce feelings. You want good feeling? Think good thoughts. Then E, mindfulness. Enjoy the now. We all have the good nows, but we are not enjoying. And then the end, it has happened. I accept. I can learn benefit from it. And finally, both hands empty, thankful to God. I usually uh, advocate to my clients, those who come with depression, anxiety disorder as a therapist, I would recommend they make sure circadian cycle is strong, exercising, and then do the tent every three hours. The first thing they do in the morning, the last thing they do at night, and in between every three hours, top up the long-term endorphin. And tremendous results. Many uh, of the clients reported an amazing feeling of wellness. And what they have to do is to maintain it, don't get careless. And so to face times of crisis, Uka, uncertainty, volatility. We need to have this sense of vision for our life. We need to understand this uncertainty will go away after a while. We need clarity about the complexity. And finally, in place of ambiguity, we need agility, mental, emotional agility to handle it. Now, the last Illustration I would put would be a, a very well observed phenomenon. We give it the name Stockdale. Now, James Stockdale was a commander who, in 1965 to 73, nearly a period of eight years, was the highest ranking officer uh, captured as a, a prisoner of war. As you could imagine, in those times, things were not nice. He faced the most brutal reality of his day, which any moment he could die. And he saw many of the fellow POWs die. But because he kept retaining the faith, I will be alive. I'm waiting to see my wife again when I'm alive. I'm serving my country. Now, we call this a Stockdale paradox. In the one hand, he faced the reality of his day, mental health excellent. The other one, he had hope. He explained later, he saw people with a lot of hope, too optimistic, but refused to face reality, waiting every other day to be set free. And after a while, they gave up. They died of a broken heart. Looks like people abandoned them. Then he saw others who could not accept the reality of their day. And so later, he explained, by holding on to this paradox, the reality of today is we have the pandemic around us. We have the lockdowns, movement, you know. We can't move freely as we used to. And yet we have the faith, this too shall pass. We have a thankfulness. We still have our loved ones around us. Whatever that has happened, has happened. We don't keep imagining the fears of the night. And I hope this short 60 minutes of sharing, ladies and gentlemen, would help you cope with this time of crisis. 
the heart must practice gratitude and thankfulness. Start with gratitude, thankfulness for your loved ones who are with you. They never had the time for some of the busy workers here. Your family members never saw much of you. Now you're stuck to one another. Now be creative. Go learn some new language. Go learn some new uh, menu. Cook it for the family. But remember, most of all, exercise every day. Sweat your body six days a week. Rest on the seventh day. And then make sure what you do that in your body get morning sun. So then your circadian cycle is healthy. I trust that this short sharing is of some use for you. In the aspect uh, list, we have all sorts of quality assured training. We have uh, 200 accredited, highly experienced instructors majoring in their field. I am one of the few of us who do the uh, psychological leadership aspect. There are many of our uh, consultants, highly skilled in different industries, the best in the world. Aztec collects them and Aztec courses gives you that value added. So we thank you for your participation. We look forward that you will uh, come and attend our webinars and when the training open up, do come for our training all over the world. Thank you very much. Questions, other things can be directed. Our email is available. Just send to us. So we'll find a way to answer you. Thank you. I have a question and I think it's, I have un time to answer. There's a question here. Uh, how do you manage situation of lockdown at home when your family expecting enough from you but you lack the resources to provide? How do I learn a new menu to cope when the resources are not there? That's true. I mean, there are limitations to this. Let's do make do with what we have. I liken it to the analogy. Bob Guerra's parents would look at the situation and say, it looks helpless. But I think they may do. They look for help where they could. And this is what we are called to do now. And uh, I share with you the reality. It's like a Stockdale paradox. I mean, it's easy now looking back, he survived. But for the one person who survived, there were dozens of others who never made it. Eh? Nevertheless, our only hope is to make do with what we have. And that is not sickle, that is reality. We have to practice mindfulness, accept the now that we have. Right? And uh, we trust we can, we can discuss more when the opportunity arises. Thank you, thank you. And no other questions, we'll sign off. Any other things, send us an email, the uh, Aztec emails are available. And we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, this same seminar, webinar, we're going to lengthen it and make it available as uh, uh, online learning over a period of two days. We'll take you through managing body, mind, and spirit. Uh, if you are interested, do send us, send to Aztec email, our contact, uh, your inquiry, and our staff will respond to you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.